soon. Can you hear me okay? Let's go ahead and start. There may be a few more trickling in, and so please help them find places to sit. I'm very pleased to welcome you today. I'm Carol Runyon. I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health and director of the Pediatric Injury Prevention Education Research, or PIPER, program that is co-hosting with um, the Department of Emergency Medicine, the visit of Dr. Wintermute from University of, Cal of um, California, Davis. Um, Welcome to all of you. I know there's a mix in the audience, and before I introduce our speaker, let's just, I want to get a feel for the audience. How many of you are students in the School of Public Health? <laughs> students in other schools? Faculty in either School of Public Health or School of Medicine? Or other schools, I guess. And people from outside the university. What a nice mix, so thank you. Um, so I'm really pleased today to introduce um, I guess I shouldn't say old friend, longtime friend um, and colleague, Garen Wintemute. Um, Dr. Wintemute is um, <coughs> trained in family medicine, emergency medicine, and is a faculty member. He's the um, Susan ba Baker and Stephen Terrett chair, holds the Susan Baker and Stephen Terrett chair in violence prevention at the University of California, Davis. Um, he's also the founding director of their Violence Prevention Research Program, which is a rapidly growing program. Um, I've been learning more about it during his visit, and he's, he's been doing great stuff for many, many years um, with a small team and is rapidly expanding his team and I know is, is poised to do even greater stuff in the years ahead. Um, Garen's recipient of many awards, including APHA's Distinguished Career Award a year ago, um, and multiple publications in both the public health and medical literature um, about violence as a public health problem and specifically firearms as an issue for public health and for medicine. Um, I think for the students in the audience, I would encourage you to think about his remarks. I don't know exactly what he's going to say, but think about it from the perspective of doing public health research to inform and guide policy. Because that's kind of the gist of what um, his work has been and I, what I think he's going to tell us about. So welcome, Garen, and uh, welcome all of you. Hi, folks. Um, I'm Garen. I, I'm going to refer to myself as uh, Carol's durable friend. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we are, in fact, going to talk about violence as a public health problem today. I don't need to make that case to this group. Other groups, you have to make that case. A um, couple reasons why it's worth talking about. Um, one, I think, well conceptualized by the head of CDC 15 years ago, who simply said, if violence isn't a public health problem, then why are all these people dying from it? Um, I'm a clinician, and specifically, I'm an emergency medicine clinician. And to clinical audiences, I simply point out that 80% of people who die from firearm violence in the United States either die where they were shot or die in the emergency department or very shortly after they uh, go upstairs to uh, an operating room of wounds that are not survivable, not today and not, a, not in any foreseeable future. So to clinicians, I say, if we are going to impact the number of people who die from gunshot wounds, we need to prevent them from getting shot in the first place. We need to move upstream in that flow of events that brings them to the emergency department. I don't need to make that case to you people, but you can make that case, use that information to make that case to your friends. Um, but as, as Carol said, um, I, I'm both a clinician as a, and a researcher. I was a doctor before I was a researcher. I do the research because I'm interested in preventing people from coming to the emergency department. And in this particular field, that means working on preventing people from getting shot. And that means working on policy. And that means we're going to be talking about the transition from research to policy today. Now, <clears throat> Um, with apologies to people who were at the talk I gave yesterday, there's some overlap because I think there's some basic points that, that deserve being made, and, and you all can um, be checking your email while I'm making those points. Um, but I, I warn you, the talk will diverge, and this is going to be an interactive conversation, not right up front, but, but later. If you doze off, I will call on you. Um, but towards the end of the talk, um, I hope we're going to get interactive. I'm going to talk about some specific research studies 
and their applicability to policy. Sometimes I'll leave that between the lines because you can figure it out. But we're going to end the talk or, or come close to ending the talk by looking at a particular study um, that I have uh, chosen as an example of a way not to approach this problem. And I'm going to ask you to work with me to dissect this study and its flaws. Um, it has the attractiveness, had the attractiveness of being very easy to do, and therefore it got done, and I'll save the rest of it um, for later. So first, let's just talk about um, all those people that the Surgeon General was talking about back in the 90s. Um, I'm not going to read through these numbers. You can see them. Um, but I've just been informed. I have this very cute thing that it's not a laser printer, but it makes the cursor, oh, it doesn't. But you can turn around. Oh, I can do what? You can point up there. No, I can't. I'm supposed to point it here. Oh. Try that. That doesn't work either. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did it work? There. Well, there's the... Oh, my goodness. Okay, <laughs> but it's supposed to work. Now it's working here. There we go. It just woke up. All right. So a little over 300,000 people have died from firearm violence. These are civilians. This is actually going to distract me from talking. Um, in the most recent 10 years for which we have data, the number goes up a little bit if you add in the unintentional deaths and so on. From here on out, I'm going to be referring collectively to firearm suicide and homicide as firearm violence. For purposes of this discussion, I'm going to leave unintentional deaths and the unintendeds and the legal interventions and the homicide by cop um, out, of, out of the picture. That's another topic, I think. Um, a little over 30,000 deaths a year, nearly 70% of all homicides, a majority and an increasing majority of suicides committed with firearms. And the aggregate cost, not just medical care cost, but societal cost, criminal justice cost, um, as you can see, adds up to what most people would consider to be real money. I'm going to digress just for a moment to help set the stage about the main focus of the talk and talk about mass shootings. Um, I'm mindful that we are in Aurora. I'm mindful that James Holmes's case um, is back in the news. It's going to be in the news for the next decade at one level or another. Um, I'm sorry. I need to go back. But I was, try I was trying to cut through some time. Um, I want I to make, um, let me make a subsidiary point. As an epidemiologist, numbers like, I've learned that numbers like this tend to blur for people, and comparisons sometimes are more helpful. So let me set up a comparison. I've got a picture of Arlington in the background. Um, some, how many people figured out that was Arlington in the background before I mentioned it? Some? Ah, that's Arlington. The reason I put it in is to allow me to make this point. The number of civilian deaths from firearm violence in the United States in the most recent 10 years for which we have data outnumber our combat fatalities, all mechanisms of injury put together from World War II, outnumber our combat fatalities from all other conflicts in the nation's history from the revolution to the present combined. We've been burying people at Arlington since 1864. And in the ensuing 151 years, we have put more than 400,000 people in the ground at Arlington. That's a lot over 150 years, 151 years. We could fill a parallel Arlington with civilians in somewhere between 12 and 13. Now I will move on to that next slide and talk about mass shootings. Um, some of you may recognize this photograph. It was taken about uh, three years ago. Uh, was taken about three miles from where we all are right now. This is Aurora a few days after the shooting happened. Um, on the one hand, None of us will ever escape whatever memories we have of, of those events in 2012 and before and after. And, and it is worthy of pause to reflect on the fact that we are probably the only industrialized society that has cause on a frequent interval to create these middle little um, Arlingtons for civilians. On the other hand, we need to put this in perspective. Take Columbine and Virginia Tech and Tucson, where Gabby Giffords was shot, here at Aurora Sandy Hook. All of them combined, 90 people died outside the shooters. 90 people too many, and I'm not trying to mitigate those tragedies. But we lose, on average, 89 people a day, day in and day out, civilians, all of them, to firearm violence. <coughs> we cannot, as people dedicated to the public's health, formulate our interventions, formulate our responses, in response to a highly salient but very small portion of the problem. It is our responsibility, personally and as we communicate with society, to remind everybody else about the bulk of the problem. 
Now, let's do some data. This is an image that you are all familiar with, even if you've never seen it. This is the image. This this is uh, a display of uh, death rates from firearm homicide among males in 2012 by age and by race slash ethnicity. And the message of the graph, and the immediate message of the graph, is is obvious. Risk for firearm homicide is far higher at essentially all ages among African American males than it is for anybody else. That's been true for as long as these data have been collected. And I am not aware of another health condition that is so narrowly focused in a single demographic group as firearm, firearm homicide is focused among African-American males. Freeze that image in your mind's eye as we switch same general display from homicide to suicide. The picture is very much different. White males are at, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take questions at the end. Is I'm that okay? I'm just going to ask if we'll ever be able to get copies of your slide. Yes. Um, because it would keep us from taking quite such detailed notes. Yes. The entire presentation <laughs> is being videotaped and will be available on our website as okay, well with you. the slides. And if, and if they ask me for it, I will separately give them the slides to put up on their website as well so that you don't have to listen to an hour's talk to see. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Um, so the image, the, the picture, very different. White males at highest risk. It starts um, at age five to nine when risk is first measured. It goes up more frequently for white males during adolescence. It sort of plateaus for a little bit. Then it takes off, and then it takes off um, even more rapidly. A very different picture. What I'm going to do now is combine suicide and homicide and talk again about firearm violence. We are again looking at um, rates here. We're looking at deaths per 100,000 people. The graph, the, the image for African-American males hasn't changed much. Risk is so high there that it remains predominant. In that group, the vast majority of firearm deaths are homicides, and we're going to come back to that in just a second. For white males, the vast majority of deaths are firearm suicides. So I haven't added much to the blue line from the slide before in adding homicides. So let me go back and, and make the not quite but close to correct point that that blue line you're seeing there pretty much is the blue line that you're seeing here. It's just that it has been squished toward the horizontal by the much higher rates among African-American males. Is everybody with me on this? Okay, because now I'm going to turn this kind of analysis sideways, if you will. So far, this slide included, we've been taking the classic public health approach to characterizing this problem. It's an approach based on risk. We've been looking at deaths per 100,000 members of the population. But a, an entirely complementary, not contradictory, complementary approach is the population health approach, which points out that the burden of illness, the number of cases of any given health condition, can be greatest among people who are at low risk for that condition if the number of people at low risk is big enough. To give you a concrete example, most heart attacks occur among people who do not have a boatload of risk factors for coronary heart disease because there are so many such people. So on the one hand, there is a risk factor uh, based approach to preventing cardiovascular death, and that makes a lot of sense. Risk will be reduced the most, perhaps, in the population that's at highest risk to begin with. But you can't ignore the far larger population that's also suffering these events at a lower rate um, uh, that may not benefit as much from risk factor based interventions, but needs something that needs an intervention that addresses the population as a whole. Is everybody still with me? Okay, perfect. So watch this. Now we are going from firearm violence on a risk basis to firearm firearm violence, easy for me to say after 30 years, um, on a burden basis. All I'm doing is taking the denominator away. The death count is the same as we go from risk to burden. This is deaths from firearm violence by race, ethnicity, by age, 2012. And note what happens. Let me go back. Risk, burden, risk, burden. I could stay there all day. Um, so let me quantify this for a little bit. In that left-hand peak, the sort of 30-year age span that um, 
defines the, the ascent to the summit of that peak among African-American males. Um, in 2012, there were just under 600, excuse me, just under 6,000 deaths in that peak, and 90% of those deaths were homicides. The peak to the right, 30-year uh, age span, there were more than 9,000 deaths, and 90% of those deaths were suicides. What's more, for the, for the white male suicide problem, things are getting worse. And this time, I really do need the pointer, so give me a second. So we're going to start with the two red lines, and you are seeing that, yes, you are. The two red lines here, um, which give data for firearm violence, suicide, and homicide together for African Americans. The rate has changed very little. It's gone up and down, but on balance, that's a pretty horizontal line I'm, I'm visually fitting there for almost a decade. The number of deaths has gone up on balance from here to here by about 10%. Um, but that's population growth. The rate has not changed. For white males, the absolute rate is so much lower that you can't really see the deflection upward from the horizontal well. But that rate has actually gone up by about 30% in the last seven or eight years or so. The change in the number of deaths, given the size of the population, is much more obvious. And it, it has gone up by more than 35%. Most people would consider that to be um, an epidemic. And the best, I actually have looked at, I just haven't gotten it into the slides, the 2013 data, and I can tell you that that ascent um, is continuing. I meant to put in a pop quiz here, and I forgot, so we're just going to go ahead. Um, the pop quiz was going to be, but my guess was that everybody in this state would know the answer. The pop quiz was going to be true or false, rates of firearm homicide and suicide go up together. People tend to think that they do. If you're in a place that has a lot of firearm violence, you just have a lot of firearm violence, and that's simply not true. What we've got here is that, it's, so this, this display I'll work out for you, or line out for you. Here's homicide, and here's suicide um, in 2012, and we were again back to rates, not numbers. Um, so it's the case, it isn't, instead, it's the case that the states with the highest and the states with the lowest firearm homicide rates, uh, excuse me, suicide rates, tend to have low firearm homicide rates, and the states that have the highest homicide rates tend to have sort of toward the Midland um, firearm suicide rates. If you can't see it, Colorado is right there sharing space on the graph with Kansas. Um, and you guys know this already, but look at the Intermountain West here. Here's Nevada. Um, Arizona's just got a little bit more homicide. New Mexico's up here. And we've had lots of conversations over the last couple of days about what might be going on here. And um, for those of you who aren't involved, I'll just tell you there's a lot of good research um, going on here and being, being designed and developed to try and not only figure this out, but do something about it. All right. Um, I'm going to switch gears and move from the epidemiology to the policy side of all of this. I'm going to talk about some risk factors. And my, um, my intent here, which I'm going to make explicit, is um, talk about risk factors that might be opportunities for policy intervention, hint, hint, as you all are thinking about what you um, might want to be doing next. I'm going to talk about three of them. One is a prior history of criminal activity, uh, excuse me, <coughs> Uh, in particular, violent criminal activity. Another is alcohol abuse. And the, the third is controlled substance abuse. The stories are a little bit different, and I'll walk through them. But first, um, I wanted to first off say congratulations to you all um, as a state and to you individually for whatever you had individually to do with it um, on the enactment of comprehensive background checks um, here in Colorado. Um, this is this is something I've I've worked on a lot and am continuing to work on. We're going to be evaluating um, the impact of Colorado's law, just in case anybody is wondering, um, along with the impact of Washington's law and the impact of other um, similar statutes that have been passed going back 25 years now. Um, here are background checks for those of you who didn't live, eat, and live, eat, and breathe it recently. Here are background checks in a nutshell. There is almost universal agreement that there are some subsets of the population 
that are at, at unacceptably high risk for misusing a firearm, such that those people should not be allowed to purchase or possess firearms. Not everybody agrees with that, but most of the most people believe that felons and people who've been served with domestic violence restraining orders and 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 other groups shouldn't be allowed to have guns. You can't enforce those policies if at the moment a gun is changing hands, you don't know who the members of those, those high-risk populations are. And background checks fundamentally have one simple purpose. They provide information on, is this person a member of a prohibited group, yes or no, at the critical moment when the firearm is about to change hands. That's all they do. They're that simple and they're that reasonable. So congratulations to you all for getting that done. Let's talk about criminal history first. Um, I'm going to be showing you mostly work that we've done. Um, I, I, as, as I've been talking with people around here for the last couple of days, California is a great place to do this kind of work. We have wonderful data. We make it um, available for research purposes. We have a legislature that likes doing, likes innovating in this area and likes being informed by science. So let's start with um, uh, some data on the question, is a history of prior criminal activity predictive of future criminal activity among people who purchase handguns as it is in the general population? We did a study some years ago in which we enrolled administratively, it's a record-based study, a large cohort of people who sought to purchase handguns, some of whom had no prior criminal activity whatsoever, no criminal record, I should say, and others had been convicted of one or more crimes. We followed those people forward for 15 years and using criminal records, and the question was, did they get arrested for something? And the answers are on the slide. Now, let me kind of walk you through this. Some of you are very familiar with this kind of display and others possibly not so much. So I'm going to take just a moment. Our outcome measure is, here we are, relative risk. Um, when I say relative risk, um, the plain English translation of that is times as likely as, if you will. So when I say that one group had a relative risk of, I can't aim this thing, a relative risk of 5.9 uh, compared to some other group, in plain English, group A is 5.9 times as likely as group B to have something happen, okay? Um, and for those of you who are accustomed to all of this, um, I've stripped the confidence intervals out just so the slides are legible, the differences are statistically significant. This is all published, and you can have that if you want. We're looking at risk of arrest over a 15-year period of uh, follow-up for offenses of varying kinds. This is a term of art. The violent crime index offenses are murder, rape, robbery, or aggravated assault. We are looking, our referent group is people who, at the time they bought their handguns, had no prior criminal record, law-abiding gun owners. Our groups of interest are people who've been convicted <coughs> one or more times of various sorts of crimes. We might collectively refer to them as not-so-law-abiding gun owners. Um, and let me just specify what we're talking about here. Um, these classifications in these groups were assigned hierarchically. So here on the top line, we have people who, at the time they legally bought their gun, uh, had been convicted of only one crime, and that a crime that involved neither firearms nor violence. DUI would be here. Petty theft would be here. Misdemeanor drug offenses would be here. And here's the, here's the group of people with two or more such convictions. Move down a row, one conviction uh, they may have, people in this row may have had any number of convictions up here, but the key point is that they had only one conviction involving a firearm or two or more, and you get the idea. I think these are people who, whatever else they had, had one or two or more prior convictions for offenses involving violence. And before I go further, I should, I should emphasize these are all legal purchases of handguns. There are no felons in here. These are misdemeanor convictions. Felons are prohibited under federal law. They don't get to buy their guns. They're not in the study. These are legal purchases. So let's start at the top, and then we will move directly to the bottom. Um, so as compared to people with no prior criminal record, those legal handgun purchasers um, with only one prior conviction involving, et cetera, we're at approximately five-fold increase in risk for all the outcomes in the study. Notice what we call a dose-response effect. As you go from one to two or more, the numbers get bigger. The badder you were, the badder you will be, um, is a plain English translation. Let me come down here to the criminologists go, well, yeah. Um, so down here at the bottom, though, 
two or more prior convictions for a, a violent misdemeanor, whatever else they had, um, anywhere between 10 and 15 times as likely as uh, the referent group to be arrested for murder, rape, robbery, or aggravated assault. Um, and for the methods folks in the crowd, we adjusted, of course, um, for the entire content of the criminal history and for demographics and so on. Um, and these are the adjusted values that I'm presenting. Now, again, these were all legal handgun purchases. In most of the country, this group can still legally buy handguns. And most of the rest of the country, as of the moment, includes Colorado. In California, that's no longer true. Our state innovated and expanded its denial criteria to include people who had been convicted of violent misdemeanors. In essence, they took these bottom, I will get the hang of this by the time we're done. They took these bottom two rows out of the gun purchasing population. Our research had nothing to do with it. It was that that act was taken before this research was done. We were in the happy position to come along after the fact and see if that experiment proved out or not. So here's our evaluation of California's expansion of its denial criteria. By now, you're used to the setup of the slides, so let me sketch out again who's in the study. Again, two groups of people who purchased handguns. One group sought to purchase its, its handgun in the first year of our state's new policy. They had a violent misdemeanor conviction or more than one, and their purchases were denied. In the other group were people with one or more violent misdemeanor convictions who sought to purchase their firearms in the last two years of the old policy, and their policies were approved. As we framed the study at the time, the exposure of interest was exposure to a perhip, excuse me, a permitted purchase of a handgun, which I, I can fill in the details if we if we need to, which almost always translates into acquisition of a handgun. That very few people walk away from the deposit that they've put down. So we have two groups of people. Everybody's been convicted of a violent misdemeanor. Um, they turned out to be very, very similar in all sorts of covariates, which we adjusted for anyway. Um, you are, and, and these are the adjusted results. And in this case, our referent group is the people whose purchases were denied. So the question here is, what's the effect of the exposure purchase of a handgun? Um, we aggregated our crimes into those involving guns or violence and other kinds. We'll look at these first. Here's the overall result, that there was an approximately 30% increase in risk, and this was over three years of follow-up, 30% increase in risk of arrest for a fire, uh, crime involving uh, firearms or violence among people who purchased a handgun after controlling for all those other factors, et cetera. Um, at age 21 to 24, when the absolute rates of arrest were highest, we see a 40% increase in risk, and you can see the rest of these numbers you already have. I want to emphasize this group right here, where there's no difference, where it appeared that the people who were denied the purchase of a handgun had just the same, after adjustment, the same risk of arrest as did the people whose purchases were allowed. But notice what that group is. That group is made up of the people with three or more prior convictions for offenses involving violence or firearms. My sense, and this is speculation, but I think it's pretty reasonable speculation, is that this is the group of people who have established three or more prior convictions, a pattern of, of behavior, what criminologists actually call a criminal career, but we'll call a pattern of behavior, that is from which they are not deflected by the denial of the purchase of a handgun. That this might well be the group of people who, if they're denied, find some other way to acquire a handgun and go on and do whatever they were going to do with the handgun that they tried to buy from a dealer. <clears throat> but this was a very small group in the study, and the overall effect is in that top row. And my position has, since, since working with these results has been this. The fact that a single policy innovation does not take care of risk across an entire population with a spectrum of risk factors is not sufficient to say that policy doesn't work. It works across the board. It works for almost all subsets. There's a group with an established pattern of criminal behavior for which it doesn't work. Fine. We'll come up with another intervention for that group. We have cops and other things for, for people like that. So I tend to be a, a fan, based on these data and others, 
of the idea that expanding denial criteria to include people who have criminal histories that aren't yet qualifying them for denial would probably be a good idea. We have quasi-experimental evidence that it works. We don't have a randomized trial, but that's often not the case in policy, as you know. Let's talk about number two, alcohol. We drink a lot. Um, these are data from the 2010 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. This means that 55% of the people in the survey were willing to say to a government surveyor that they drank alcohol in the last 30 days. 17% were willing to say that they binge drank at least once in the past 30 days. Five or more drinks at a setting for men, four or more drinks at a setting for women. 6% were willing to say that they drank heavily on a chronic basis, although the survey uses a couple of questions um, to get to that. They really don't ask people, so do you drink like a fish every day? Um, they ask, how many days of the month do you drink? And on days that you drink, how many drinks do you have? And then they do the math and figure it out. Um, but in any case, stick with bullet point number one. That's one exposure. There is a lot of exposure to alcohol, including to alcohol heavily on a chronic basis or in large volumes. Bullet point number two is separate. It is the exposure to firearm ownership. Um, this is not a government survey. It will be a very long time, I, I suspect, before our government will again do a survey on firearm ownership. They used to do them, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But there are good data from public opinion polling from an organization called the National Opinion Research Center at the uh, University of Chicago on firearm ownership. And you can, this is personal ownership, by the way. This is not, I've got a gun in my home. This is, I myself own a gun. Um, and the, the best estimate is that there is something between 50 million and 60 million individual handgun, excuse me, individual firearm owners in the United States. As an aside, those percentages haven't changed much. They're, if anything, drifting down a little bit for men, and they are rock solid at somewhere between 11 and 13 percent over 40 years now for women, industry campaigns um, notwithstanding. Gun sales are up. The prevalence of gun ownership is not, and that's been true for a very long time. And the thinking is that the sales don't reflect recruitment of new gun owners so much as they reflect additional purchases by people who own guns already. And when we get to prevention, that may be a, a key point. Now, bullet point number three on the slide simply puts those two common exposures together. It's back of the envelope math, right? So 30-day alcohol use among self-reported firearm owners, there's a range of estimates here. At the low end, just under 9 million firearm owners who binge drink uh, in an average month, about 2.5 million who drink heavily on a chronic basis. That's a lot of intoxicated people with firearms. But there is a range of estimates. We used to ask people about individual firearm ownership. We last did it in the 1990s. And there were eight states back in the mid-1990s that simultaneously asked, in different parts of the survey, you can be sure, um, but in the same survey, asked about firearms and alcohol. And it turned out that people who self-reported firearm ownership were substantially more likely than people who did not to also report alcohol use, any alcohol use increase of about 30%. But the kinds of alcohol use that we worry about, binge drinking, 80% more likely to report among firearm owners. Heavy chronic use, 50% more likely. So substitute those higher prevalences and some more back of the envelope math, and you come up with the high, the high range of, of those estimates there. So we all know, well, I'm sorry, let me go on to the next slide. Um, so we know that people drink a lot. Next question might be, is alcohol abuse associated with violence? So how many people think alcohol abuse is associated with If you don't raise up your hand, you must be asleep. And I'm going to call on you. So <laughs> fair enough. So, so there is a widespread understanding um, that alcohol abuse is associated with violence. And that's probably true. And, and there are a couple of review articles coming out probably over the next year that address this and address it specifically with, with regard to firearms. And that information will become more readily um, accessible. But here's, here's a, a, a quick culling. So the, the top couple of um, subsidiary bullets points there, you can ask people who are incarcerated for violent crimes 
if they were intoxicated at the time they committed the crimes that got them in the slammer. And those are the percentages of people who report that the answer is yes. Um, and those, that self-report data is considered to probably be valid. These people are incarcerated already. They have received their sentences. They don't get reduced time for saying I was drunk, it was the alcohol. They're in prison already. And, this, and the sense, um, and the people who do this work have done a lot of validation work. The sense is that those, per, those proportions are probably just about right. And the, the second set of subsidiary bullets there, the ones on um, suicide perpetrators and homicide victims, they are dead and we have tox data for them and there isn't much question about the validity there. But we all know <clears throat> the prevalence is not risk. It might be that 25 to 30 percent of the general population is drunk at any one time, right? Could be, theoretically. Any drunk people in the room? <laughs> so, um, so the second half of the slide there is about relative risk, which is really what we care about if we're doing taking a risk-based approach. I know that by now you've read to the bottom of the slide. I'm not, I'm not going to reiterate. I do want to call your attention to those relative risk estimates that are in the lower right-hand corner of the slide for risk um, of um, firearm suicide associated with acute intoxication. Um, that, that's, those are results of um, a systematic survey and a meta-analysis, um, not my work. Uh, Charlie Brannis has a paper coming out soon that, that will document this. Um, and uh, there are a lot of things you could say about relative risks like that. You could say that they're unusual. Um, I think they're just obscene, and we need to do something about it. Um, this is something new. Uh, this is, I think this is the first time this slide's been, been shown. Um, I'm writing one of those review papers I mentioned, and we went back to some data from CDC um, and massaged the data a little bit. CDC is, for, for anybody who works on alcohol, CDC has um, a new website, um, the Alcohol-Related Disease. I'm blocking on what the I stands for down at the bottom of the slide there. But you can go there. It's an interactive website, or you can pull the data and work with it and get some sense of alcohol attributable mortality by cause of death. And you can see what we've come up with here, um, which is that if you look overall, um, here are alcohol attributable uh, deaths from motor vehicle crashes. Here's all homicide and suicide together. Here's firearm homicide and suicide specifically. So for men, the plain English that we will be probably leading a press release with when this comes out is the number of alcohol-related deaths from, from gun violence, as they say in a press release, um, equals the number of alcohol-related deaths from motor vehicle crashes, which we hope will help increase the incentive about alcohol-related violence from a policy point of view as, as in addition to an individual risk factor modification point of view. Here's what's being done at the moment about alcohol. Federal statute is absolutely silent. We have lots of prohibitions in federal law on uh, purchase and possession of firearms. Alcohol is omitted. Alcohol is omitted explicitly and by design. We have, in federal law, a prohibition on firearm use by people who are controlled substance users, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. But alcohol is specifically, one at a time, excluded from beer. I, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, one at a time, beer, wine, and distilled spirits are individually excluded from the roster of controlled substances. There's no federal statute about alcohol. There is a federal statute that says it's a federal crime to possess a firearm in a state where that state level possession is a violation of state law. So the feds have basically kicked this to the states. What the states have done is this. Um, it's sort of like the really old days of legislation policy with regard to drinking and driving. There are quite a few states that have laws that basically say you can't buy or you can't possess a firearm if you are drunk or you, if you are intoxicated. But that's all that they say. That's inherently subjective. There are only three states that have moved on to a per se law with regard, um, I'm sorry, per se law means um, in the law it says if your blood alcohol is above, let's say 0.08, just to pick a, a number that's in use a lot, if your blood alcohol is a point above 0.08, you are assumed to be drunk and you have broken the law. That's what we do for drinking and driving. But we learned that for drinking and driving the hard way by having those vague subjective laws. 
Lots of states also have laws that say you can't buy a gun, you can't have a gun if you are a habitual drunkard or terms to that effect. But again, that's essentially unenforceable. You have to prove status as an habitual drunkard, and there's no agreed upon definition. There are only a few states that have, again, a per se law, but it operates differently with re regard to chronic alcohol use. Basically, those states say you can't, actually one of them uh, combines the approaches and says you can't have a gun if you're a habitual drunkard. And we define habitual drunkard to mean any of the following things, including more than one prior conviction for a DUI offense in a specified period of time. And there are a number of states that have simply said, you can't have a gun if you have more than one prior DUI conviction or related offense conviction in a specified period of time. Um, and I've asked those states for data on enforcement. And they've either been um, unwilling uh, to provide data on enforcement, or they've provided the data. And it turns out, at least on the purchase side, as far as they can tell, the statutes aren't enforced. Nobody ever asked them before. And when I asked them, so how often do people get denied because they trigger that criterion? The answer has either been, we don't know and we can't figure it out, or never. And we do know. Um, so in California, uh, that proposal was introduced in early 2013, right after Sandy Hook. Um, I'm part of a group called the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy, and we made that proposition. The legislature passed the law, passed the bill. Um, the governor vetoed it, saying there wasn't enough evidence. Um, and we are now engaged in, as I like to say, we're in the evidence business, um, and we're now engaged in a number of studies that will furnish the evidence, whatever it is. I'm, I'm actually not in equipoise um, about this, but we'll have the evidence, and then we'll probably come back to the legislature. Let me say something quickly about, oh, I mentioned I was going to talk about controlled substance use, and I'm not um, with slides. So let me just make this point about controlled substance use. Um, we have a prohibition. It's essentially impossible, this same problem only worse, it's essentially impossible to operationalize the vague language of the federal prohibition such that the number of people in the federal background check data as being controlled substance users is well under 1% of what it ought to be because nobody ever reports somebody as being a controlled substance addict because nobody knows how to define it. That's, gonna be, that's probably being fixed. Let me just talk very quickly about mental illness. Um, besides mass shootings, the other thing that rocketed to the forefront of the public's mind with regard to firearm violence was the, the clear nexus between serious mental illness and interpersonal violence. And I'm going to slightly overstate the case and say that that nexus simply does not exist. It's a myth. Now let me get a little bit more specific. There's been some very careful work done, and you've already seen it, the attributable risk for serious mental illness by itself for interpersonal violence is something under 5%. It's probably right around 4%. In plain English, you can attribute about 4% of serious interpersonal violence to mental illness by itself. The situation is more like this, that age, sex, testosterone poisoning is a real phenomenon, um, and the other risk factors I've already mentioned, prior violence, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, are major risk factors, and those things are true whether you're mentally ill or not. When you adjust for those risk factors, risk associated by mental illness itself is it exists, but it's low enough that carefully designed studies haven't always found it or self-directed violence, suicide and self-harm, as you can see, the picture is very different. But we're not talking about psychosis there. We're talking about depression. So mental illness is very much involved in firearm violence, just not the way we think it is. Um, and in interest of moving on to something else, I'm just going to skip this last part. If you have questions about mental illness, ask me. But I want to move on to this, because this is the fun part. Is everybody awake? Mm -hmm. So um, the graphic is the cover of a um, magazine called America's First Freedom, which is the journal of record of the National Rifle Association, um, an organization to which I belong and have for a very long time. Um, you'll, you may notice, if you can see up close, this is a cop, uh, an image of my copy of America's First Freedom. I subscribe and occasionally I show up there, um, including in this issue, and you can guess why. Um, but um, I'm using it uh, to set up uh, our discussion of a, of a study that was published a couple years ago. Um, and I'm intending this um, for everybody, but the people I'm expecting answers from are the, the students in the crowd because we're going to do a little bit of critique here, okay? So um, 
The answer to the question at the top of the slide is something everybody would like to have. And I think sometimes the temptation, um, people succumb to temptation and try and get a quick answer. So let's talk about a study. This is a published study. It was published in JAMA Internal Medicine 2013. If anybody wants, you can read the study. You can read my commentary on it. Um, and I will say without quite violating confidentiality um, that I was intimately involved um, in the assessment of this study um, for quite some time before it was ever published. And it was published over my objections. So I, I, want, I do have a point of view here, and I think I should probably make it clear. So this was a study taking data at the state level to address the question, does state gun policy affect rates of firearm violence? Does gun control work or not? The explanatory variable here was an index, a list of 28 laws that individual states might or might not have. And, and a state could rank anywhere from 0 to 28 on this index, depending on how many of these laws they have. These laws varied from uh, child access prevention laws to laws requiring background checks for all firearm purchases to anything in between. Some of them very, very narrowly focused, some of them really quite broad. Um, the outcome variable was firearm mortality. Um, and this was, by the way, this was a cross-sectional study. I didn't put that part in here. Um, uh, the investigators looked at total firearm mortality. Once they were prompted to do so, they also looked separately at firearm suicide and homicide for 2007 through 2010. The data were pooled. Here are some results. OK, everybody wake up now. Um, the primary finding, as reported in the study, was that the more statutes a state had, the more rigorous was its gun control regime, uh, the less firearm mortality it had. Let me walk you through the slide, and then I'm going to ask you to find the, you know, what's wrong with this picture stuff, right? So on the left-hand side, <clears throat> we have the states ranked by quartiles according to how many of the laws on the index that they had. They ranged, in fact, from 0 to 24. Nobody ranked a 28. The outcome measure is a little bit unusual, but there's nothing wrong with the outcome measure in and of itself. They started with the group of states in the quartile with the least amount of regulation on the books, took their rates as a referent, pooled rates, and then looked quartile by quartile at the question, by how much per 100,000, in numerator per 100,000 people, were rates reduced as the number of laws on the books went up. So to give you just one example, comparing states with three or four laws to states with zero to two laws, there was pooled data, a reduction of about one and a half per 100,000 people per year in death rates from firearm violence of all sorts. OK? Now, observations. Anybody, anything? I'm sorry? It's not what you'd expect. Why? In what specific way is it not what you would the expect? The more laws there are, the more suicides. It's the other way around. And, right. Oh, okay. So, so the highest. I'm right. Sorry. So this is a decrease, and decrease. that's that's why I took a minute. It, it is. It's, everybody does that. The rates are going up. No, the rates are going down by a wider margin. Okay. Okay. Everybody's got that. The numbers are too small. Okay. Do you mean the the decreases are are well, small? Six people. For 100,000 doesn't seem very many. Uh-huh. Fair enough. So th while these numbers, if you translate them into actual deaths, are, are small. Good. Keep going. How many states have zero to two laws? How many states These are quartiles. Um, they divided the states into quartiles, and then it turned out oh, that those were the, oh, those, oh, yep, yeah. OK. So um, 50 is not divisible by four, but close enough. OK? Keep going. Ma'am? It seems to me that the purpose of most of these laws is to decrease homicides, oh. but that's not going down where the suicides are. Bonus points territory with a bullet. Oh. The <laughs> metaphor is everywhere. So, um, so yes, I, I didn't give you the list, but, but, but take it from me. You are exactly right. Most Think about it. How many laws do we have in the books to prevent gun suicide, right? Not so much. We always think about crime. And with the exception of things like cap laws and so on, um, most of the statutes in this index are very clearly specifically targeted at preventing criminal firearm violence. Where is the effect? On suicide. It's all on suicide. 
Now, just as an aside, for, the, for those of you who do research, this paper initially only looked at firearm violence in total as an outcome measure. And the authors were resistant to splitting suicide and homicide. And they would have missed that fact, that laws intending to affect one sort of outcome instead affected another. Good. What else? No dose response. Well, I think they for would homicide. argue that. I think they, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, one could, could probably argue, uh, correct, no dose response for homicide. So it is simply not the case for homicide that the decrease gets larger, the number gets bigger, the decrease gets larger, the more laws you have. There is a dose response for suicide, correct? You all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? There's one more thing I'm hoping somebody will go for, and if not, I'll just give it to you. Did they factor in the differences in terms of population among the states? How do you mean? Demographic differences? Yeah. No. Just, no. So, like, in general, like, comparing Montana to, I don't know, I'm trying to think of, like, a peaceful state. I don't know. But, like, <laughs> just comparing states isn't always, like, apples to apples. Correct. The answer is no. Yeah. Another hand over you, ma'am. Um, wouldn't you want to compare your reference group to be zero laws? What if they had two really comprehensive? Good. Nice. They decided to go by quartiles, but I agree. And, and I honestly don't remember now how many states had zero. If faced with that, did everybody hear her comment, by the way? Okay. Um, faced with, if there's only one state with zero, I'm probably going to do some pooling and take the hit. So I've got, yep. Um, anything else? Go for it. Did they do any estimation of the number of lives that would be saved if laws were incorporated across the entire United States? They did not. Did not? They did not. Want to try for one? Well, I, I just have a question. Was the referent time frame the same? Yes. Okay. Yes? I was just going to ask about <clears throat> the prevalence of guns in each of the states. Come to that. Okay. <laughs> we'll come to that. Good, like good. That's the other big point here. But it's not on this slide. So which laws? Yes. Yeah. Uh, was there any sort of, I don't even know how you would do this, but some sort of control for like the social differences no. across states? Because no. there's some sort of correlation between those states that are likely to pass certain laws mm -hmm. and the, those people who are likely to vote for those laws may or may not correlate with the types of people who would purchase guns. Or be Did violent, everybody hear what she said? Or any number of other factors that is really difficult to measure. Okay. Say that. Just say it again. Make it a statement, <laughs> not a question. <laughs> uh, so was there any sort of... Make it a statement. Uh, <laughs> controlling for societal factors such as uh, groups of people that would vote for these kinds of laws correlating with groups of people who would purchase guns or be violent would explain some of those differences. Perfect. And we're going to put that comment together with Des's question. And you think about why I just said that. Do you remember what he asked about? No. He asked about no, gun ownership. I was formulating yeah, mine. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he asked about gun ownership. Okay. And I know that you've already done it. Um, so which laws? Yeah, it could be. Could it's not there. And I'm not summarizing. They, they paid no attention to which laws. They simply counted up the number of laws on the books. Were these laws, excuse me, likely to have a big effect, likely to have a small effect, likely to have a broad effect, likely to have a narrow effect? They paid no attention to that. I, I'm not kidding. All they did was count up the number of laws you had. And oh, by the way, of course, there was nothing about whether the laws are actually enforced or not, et cetera. But, but the fundamental point is, and if you're a legislator, which of the 24 laws do you pass? Right? So let's move on. Yes, here's your point. Um, so, uh, or it will be in a minute. So um, now what we're doing is we're going to adjust. I'm sorry, um, some, some people asked about adjustment. Um, in the slide I just presented, the answer to the question is no. The adjusted results are here. I apologize if I, I was not clear about that. Um, so here, you're used to the, you're used to the um, tabular display, but now we are, we are looking at an adjusted rate ratio. So we're back to the times as likely as not that sort of decrease in rates. We are, we are still with those same quartile by number of laws. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and here, and, and I've got this, um, there we go. Um, this is, uh, back, sorry, one second. 
Yes. So um, the absolute decrease, th I just needed to refresh my memory here. So on this prior slide, we're looking at absolute decrease um, in rates. These are, again, the, the, overall, abs the overall relative risk. I, I had a um, synaptic gap there and thought for a second we were looking at suicide, but this is overall. In any case, um, when you adjust for age, it appears that there probably is still a dose response effect. When you adjust for age and those other factors that people ask me about, um, what happens? Probably still there, but it's getting a little bit smaller. We've got some confidence intervals here. It's, it's really only significant at, at the comparison of the lowest and the highest quartiles with regard to amount of regulation. When you throw in firearm ownership, what happens? The differences completely disappear. It's all gone. Right? Now. When the authors did the study, they did not include firearm ownership. They were resistant to the suggestion that firearm ownership be included. The editors insisted it was included. These results happened. The authors don't mention that adjusting for firearm ownership takes all the effects, effects away um, in the manuscript. The commentary does. Um, but to put your point and your point together, it's probably it may very well be the case. It's a completely adequate explanation of the data that states are likely to pass more laws if they are in some way predisposed to pass more laws for whatever social or demographic reasons, one of which might be that not many people in those states own guns. Itself, gun ownership itself perhaps being a product of those demographic factors, but at, at a minimum, at a political level, if you are if you are a state that doesn't have a lot of gun owners in it, it might be easier to pass uh, uh, statutes regulating gun ownership. Okay, so I'm going to move on because I see that we're basically out of time. So a bunch of things went wrong with this study. It's a cross-sectional study. Correlation doesn't apply. Causation. Um, that scorecard came from a bunch of advocacy groups. Um, probably on this slide, the, the, um, the biggest things to point out um, is their modeling only allowed for additive effects from, from 0 to 28, right? Um, the other, um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide, is with their findings, all the effect comes from suicide. The other point that came up in, in review of the manuscript was, excuse me, you're assuming that all of these statutes are going to have equal effect, right? You're adding them up. You need to assign some weights. And it turned out that there are weights out there about these that a consensus group has come up with. And assigning the weights to, to, to sort of predict what the size of the effect of each of those laws would be made absolutely no difference, which either means that the weights are bogus or that the laws aren't making a difference, at least for the effects that they were looking at. And there's some other stuff. So I'm going to stop about that. And I've got one more slide. I just want to make a, a very personal old guy rant point about, about this. Um, so, so obviously, I, I was the person making those suggestions and stuff. And, um, I was angry at the time. And I realized putting this talk together, um, I still get angry thinking about this. And, and I tried to understand why, a couple of years later, it, it still makes me angry. And part of it is that these people did bad science. They did, as far as I'm concerned, lazy science. And, um, and that's just never good. But I'm a clinician also. And I was a clinician before I came a became a researcher. Um, and, and I encounter, on a regular professional basis, the fact that these numbers reflect real people real deaths and real grieving and suffering. And to not give our very best effort to understanding what killed those people and what injured them and what caused the grief and, and dismay that their families have been, have been facing, not to do our very best is to disrespect those people and to disrespect what they have suffered. And I find that just not tolerable. So last slide. That's the end of the rant. Um, Again, for the, for the junior investigators in the room, the question I think comes up, is this a field for you? And I, and I will very quickly move through this, and then I will stop. Had a lot of conversations over the last couple of days with people who are sort of thinking I might get involved, or they are involved, and not sure they continue, should, could, should continue to be involved. And to all of you, I would say this. First off, violence, let alone or firearm violence, let alone violence as a whole, is a much bigger problem than we think it, it is. We know the size of the problem based on the stuff that we can count easily, but have also had some conversations. I'm thinking about breakfast this morning in particular 
about the things that we can't count. Um, we don't think enough about the consequences of violence, about the prevalence of PTSD, about the prevalence of anxiety disorder, about the prevalence of I can't hold a job because I can't stop thinking about my son's murder, whatever it might be. We have no good estimates of that, at least not specifically for firearm violence. There is plenty of intellectual elbow room left. This field is by no means um, fully occupied. There's even money now, at least some of the time, um, for specific measures as opposed to gun control in general. For specific policy measures, there is broad support among the public. There's broad support for a lot of those specific measures on the part of firearm owners. They are willing to, sell, to tell surveyors that. There's an interest group in an industry in, in opposition that's either a, an attractant or a deterrent for you. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with the thing that sort of gets me up in the morning, the sort of daily reminder, which is that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. I'll stop there and thank you very much. And if there's time, we'll take questions. Yeah, let's, let's do. Okay. And, and first of all, thank you. You're welcome. Right. As long as no other class bursts in, we can take a few questions. I don't see a line at the door. Yeah. I was wondering, are you going to be on, um, have you been asked to, to be a speaker on the Katie Couric uh, gun violence special she's doing, a documentary? Oh, I think about it. It's so the first I've heard of it. Next Thursday and Friday in Denver. First I've heard of it. Okay. I get you. Anybody? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh I'm oh, sorry. I'm so I didn't sorry. wait long enough. So the Pew Research shows, okay, the Pew Survey, I should uh -huh. say. Survey said, it's, it's, I think it's like, the, it may be even in the 60s per, um, percent saying um, they support uh, uh, more like gun freedoms, gun yeah. rights. Yeah. And it's now gone down that that, that is a higher percentage than people supporting gun control, which is kind yes. of a, a big, broad term. But yes. do you want to address that? Because yes. it kind of goes against this public yes. support. Thing. Yes. Um, so <laughs> it was a dumb question. And, um, and I'm somebody who says there are no dumb questions. Um, but, but I actually agree with your point about the question. The, the options were worded uh, in a way, I, I'm not going to say that Pew did this deliberately to develop, to, to generate the response that they did, but the responses basically were, um, on the one side was gun control. We don't like the term control in the United States. Um, we, we control crime. We control pests. Guns have social value, and people think differently about something with social value, and we just don't like using the term control. Um, and on the flip side, the option was phrased in a more attractive way. Um, if you ask, but, but that aside, if you ask, including recently, including within the last year or two, if you ask for positions, I don't like the term gun control. I only use it to talk it, to talk it down like I'm doing right now. Um, if you ask people about their positions on specific policies, it's completely different. Um, comprehensive background checks, for example, depending on the survey, high 80s to low 90s uh, in the percentile, percentile of the general population, 85% of gun owners, 75% of self-identified NRA members, and more than half of, of gun dealers say that's a good idea. So I think the trick is, is, is not to stick with the sort of quick soundbite headline, let's, let's ask a question that's, that's very brief, um, answers, and ask people, oh, but we don't pass gun control, that study notwithstanding. We pass specific uh, interventions. What do you think about this one? And you'll get a different kind of response. So I just comment that because it comes up when we yes. do testimony. It's repeated. Yes, of course it is. You mentioned the one law restricting gun sales for those with a history of violent crime yes. and good data. Are there other uh, other data specifically addressing uh, policy points or laws that also have good data? Yes, um, and I, I guess um, I'm going to refer you to another source. Um, let me see if I can. Oh, I'm going to refer the group. Right. Should be right here. Um, ah. One second. Current slide. Get back down to that mean current slide again. There. Um, so 
there are two other studies that have looked at criminal, or I'm sorry, there's one other study that's looked at criminal activity. There's a high quality study that has looked at um, mental health. Um, in general, uh, the sources up here, uh, the, the two articles um, that are on the left of the slide, the top one comes from the American College of Physicians, the internists. They have put a lot of time into this. Um, the, the reference is to their position paper. The appendix is much longer than the paper itself and is a systematic literature review on precisely your point. Um, if you're interested in mental illness, hit study number two. If you want something more comprehensive, the book on the right. Last I knew, it was, it was for sale for $10 at um, Amazon. Um, cards face up. I have a couple of book chapters in there. Um, Johns Hopkins uh, University underwrote the publication of that book. It was um, from the first invitations to be involved uh, going out on December 20th, 2004, um, to the publication of the book in bookstores was a month and a half. Um, very, very good people at a very uh, a unique time in the nation's history, I think, doing their very best work. It's being sold at a loss. It costs more than $10 a head, a head to produce the physical item, as I understand it. Um, and it's not out of here. <coughs> Sir. Uh, you were complimentary on what we've done in Colorado around passing legislation <coughs> dealing with the gun issue and the gun violence issue. You may not have, uh, right now each of those laws deal, as well as uh, concealed weapons in schools. Those hearings for everyone in the room are April 13th, starting at 1 o'clock. Please come to the Capitol and testify. Thank you for the comment. Um, and I will add, based on many years of experience, um, that people in the room during hearings make a difference. That's not an empty show. It's worth your time to go. Letters to your representatives, phone calls to your representatives make a difference. I've been in the office watching legislators talk about how many letters and phone calls they've gotten from their constituents and how they've decided that that's going to determine their vote. It is not an empty exercise. Ma'am. Um, one of the things that goes on there is just dueling data and that there's a, the paradigm is that anyone can manipulate data. So how do we present these findings in a way that they're heard in this just cacophony of data? The other side totally uses junk science to maintain that there has been a massive decrease in crime in the United States while gun number of guns has increased, and therefore more guns will make us safe. So sometimes you can use additional data and for example, you can say, but rates of gun violence really haven't gone down um, in more than a decade. This is published. It's in that commentary I mentioned. It's in a couple of other places. If anybody wants a publication with this graph in it, let me know, and, and, um, and I'll, I'll send it to you. So um, we've had this conversation, too, a lot lately. Um, sometimes more data is not enough. Sometimes you need a picture. Um, sometimes you need an anecdote, a personal story. Um, there are people, and I'm not going to use terms like the other side, but there are people who understand that you can repeatedly lie and get away with it in the legislative process. I will, I, I will say only this, that lying back is not an, an appropriate response. We have to continue to tell the truth. We need to find better ways to tell the truth, but we have to tell the truth. It's on us to find those better ways until we find a way to tell the truth that can outcompel good liars. We're going to lose, but that's on us. Yeah. Um, do you, I don't know how to ask this question, it, there, you know, all the evidence, all the, the numbers are there to uh, show that at a very young age, um, uh, children are taking their lives, predominantly males, from guns in the home, and yet um, there are still the majority of pediatricians that do not ask about guns. How do you get doctors to ask about guns? I'm the wrong person. Do we have a yeah. law? They're about, they're, I, I, I'm not going to answer that question, okay. not the way you're expecting. Because I actually I'll say I don't know the answer. Somebody just handed you the answer. Um, <laughs> I, a sample. I, I will say this. There are at least half a dozen people in this room, Colorado's top people, um, are on that question right now. Oh, good. I've been hearing about it nonstop for two days. <laughs> um, this side of the room. Go ahead. So how do you encourage um, firearm owners to participate in studies about firearms? 
is there some, a public health approach that might encourage them to participate? Um, the work that I've personally done has been with firearm retailers. And with them, I followed standard survey research techniques and found them willing to participate, some of them participating even though they were vehemently opposed to what they thought were the policy objectives of the study. They were wrong about the objectives, but they participated, and that's the point. Um, so I've come away thinking, thinking this about gun dealers and thinking this about gun owners, that really they're just like us. Um, and I'm not going to ask this question. I suspect there are quite a few gun owners in the room. I might be wrong about that. Um, but that the best way to approach a gun owner, the best way to approach a gun dealer, is to forget that they're a gun owner and a gun dealer and just approach them person to person about a problem that we all face together and figure out what common ground we all might have that would allow us to move forward. If you approach them as a gun owner and keep their gun ownership up front as part of the conversation, then they're being reminded that they're a gun owner and they need to speak on behalf of all gun owners, and we all know how that one goes. So you just talk to them as people. One last question. Okay. We need to okay. And it's yours. Um, are you or others you know that are well informed on the subject matter ever asked to give expert uh, testimony before the legislative committees? Or um, are you ever contacted by governors before they're asked to sign or veto bills? Yes, I think all of us are often. Um, I do it mostly in California because that's where I, I live. Um, uh, back in the 90s during the Clinton administration, I, I testified before Congress four times, as I recall. Um, they've got to be interested in hearing it. But yes, I think um, many of us who do research in this field uh, got him interested in the research because we were interested in making a difference in society and having the evidence as a part of being able to make that difference. But we don't just do the research and walk away from it. We do the research and then continue to work on what's called the translational effort to get that research, those, that evidence translated into effective policy. Yeah, do you just, know of anybody here in Colorado? I'm going to defer that, that Carol. So I'm going to ask Carol to come up. People in Colorado who, or do you want me to stick with the question? I I don't know who you guys should be asking. Is okay. is my point? But we we can talk about that. I mean, I think there are a number of people here with varying types of expertise and varying issues in terms of getting involved with gun advocacy. People who work for the state have limitations on what they're allowed to do as right. state employees. The, the boundaries of giving information versus giving advocacy. So, but um, I'm more than happy to help steer the group to appropriate and to invite Garen back. <laughs> um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to close and thank everyone for their participation and Garen for, for coming and his talk. As I mentioned at the beginning, it was being videotaped and will be available on the Piper website within two or three weeks. Um, if you did not sign the sign-in sheet, I was going to say from the beginning, and I forgot, please do. That will help make sure we have your email address. It can alert you uh, oh, when the, the thing is posted and also to put your seminars on a variety of things. Right. And it, it also, please fill out the evaluation form because that's a plan. So, again, thank you. Thank you very much. And as you are as you are leaving. There was a time we used to give presentations like this. We would have half a dozen people come and uh, present to a group, and the panel would outnumber the audience. So I want to thank all of you for coming.